been getting a lot of emails about Vox guitars lately, um, specifically the effects that Vox built into some of their guitars in 1967 and 1968. Um, models like the Ultrasonic I have here. There's a lot of history about all that, which models had which effects, um, that they were all made in Italy at the Echo Factory, all that stuff. There's even some wiring diagrams out there, but um, people don't seem to have the schematics, um, which I, I do have hand-traced versions I've done of all of the guitars, all the effects that Vox made, and I'm working on uh, an illustrator making vector uh, PDFs people can download um, so you can actually read my chicken scratch. I'll try to clean it all up and have it on the site as soon as I can. But anyway, in the meantime, uh, people have been sending these to me for repair, uh, which I don't mind doing at all. I love these things. I love keeping them going. Um, I love playing them, certainly, but uh, I don't always think it's the best idea to ship these internationally. I never had a request from Japan, uh, one from Sweden, you know, and if if you can't find anyone in your area to do that, um, I'm more than happy to do it, but you know, for several reasons, I just don't think it's the best idea. Um, you know, mainly there's just the shit happens. I've seen really bad stuff, like irreparable stuff happen to irreplaceable things in, in shipping um, accidents. Um, this one here, you know, is Rob's Ultrasonic. Um, it's been around the world uh, with the Brian Jonestown massacre probably, I don't know, a bunch of times. And it has these common um, finish checking cracks, uh, drought cracks as some people call them. Um, if you look to at the base of the uh, palm wah, it was basically just pushed all in. I had to actually make a, a, a new arced wooden plate uh, just to support the palm wah. You know, and I know, you know, Rob uses the hell out of the palm wall. He plays, uh, like, lap steel slide and uses it. Um, but I assume that on an international flight, um, a baggage handler probably just threw a suitcase on top of this uh, guitar and it just got pushed in. I don't think he was rocking out too hard. They're, they're pretty sturdy live. So I just wanted to create some videos while I have uh, a few of them in the shop right now to show you some tips and tricks that I've learned just to keep them going. Um, you know, some people have them, the effects don't work at all. Maybe they're in various states of working, non-working order, um, and they just don't know where to begin. Uh, there's also some people too, uh, me included, that think, you know, as probably superior as these are to any other effects, uh, built-in effects, that is, uh, in any production guitar, there's kind of some spots where Vox just dropped the ball in terms of making them really user-friendly, especially in a recording or live situation. So I'll show you some easy mods that are all reversible if you just want to make them more user-friendly. Okay, so one disclaimer I do need to make before I dive into any of the actual repairs of the effects themselves is that these tutorials aren't meant for people that have no knowledge whatsoever about electronics. They're just not. Um, I get, you know, a lot of people that have these are starving musicians and they can't find anyone in their area that will work on them locally. And, you know, that's the whole point of these videos. They're, they came to me for help, but... Um, you know, what I'm trying to say is that there can be a lot more serious problems that will arise nine out of ten times when someone tries to repair their own effects and they don't know what they're doing. Because typically most of the effects repairs that I see um, that are just due to the ravages of time and normal wear and tear, they come down to one signal wire coming off somewhere or one ground wire because either like a potentiometer over rotated and pulled a small wire or um, you know maybe an electrolytic cap went or they are drifted but they're really simple generally and you know this star stream is a great example of what I'm trying to say uh, this the previous owner 
really kind of butchered it. And what you see here is this kind of gaping cavity around this effects cover plate is due to, you know, someone not being able to get their effects out in a timely, easy manner. So they just decided to cut the body of the guitar out around the motherboard. You know, there's other ways to do that. The star streams are notorious for being difficult to get in at things. I, I'm not arguing that, but what I'm, I guess I'm saying is that if you think that cutting part of your guitar's body out is a viable option towards getting your effects repaired, you're just wrong and should stop right there and, and just save your money and, and get someone, you know, who knows what they're doing to repair your effects and, and just play the guitar as a normal guitar until that point. Um, so that's my main disclaimer is that if you know what you're doing, go ahead. I hope these videos help you. If you don't, just send them as a link to a local tech who can maybe get you sorted. And, uh, you know, I know there are a lot of different opinions out there about uh, some of the mods I'm going to show you that some people say you shouldn't modify any piece of vintage gear. I mean, this isn't a 1952 uh, Gibson Les Paul, okay? But that being said as well, they have come up in value. They're, they're worth about two grand or so now. They typically trade hands for on eBay uh, for, you know, anywhere from two to I've seen three grand especially with the case and all the case candy. So the the disclaimer is that if you don't know what you're doing, um, don't attempt any of these repairs yourself because nine times out of 10, you're going to make the problem worse. I've been hearing from a lot of people that have one of these um, vintage Vox instruments, either a guitar or bass with the onboard effects and uh, they need to service them that even though they have you know say the schematic and the wiring diagram in front of them when they open them up it just doesn't make sense and they they have trouble following along uh you know you're not alone they're, they're kind of like a historical anomaly in a sense um if you look at the effects world generally uh, i can't think of anything built with exactly the same type of architecture but I mean, trust me, they're not complex circuits and everything in here pretty much has an analog in contemporary effects available as like a foot controlled standalone unit. For instance, the, the wah circuit in these, it's the same early um, Vox wah circuit that was commercially available first as a foot pedal like the Clyde McCoy, um, which, you know, looked something like this is a big tank of a pedal. The distortion is a two transistor silicon fuzz face topology. Um, pretty much the same thing as this germanium two transistor tone bender. Same amount of parts and everything, but obviously they had to make everything a lot smaller. Some of the um, plug in units that came a little bit later, you know, had got down into size considerably. But if you just look at these three effects alone next to the body of the guitar, they're like as big as the body. So. Considering Vox fit five different circuits into some of the guitars um, at that time, giving the manufacturing practices, they had to do some kind of unconventional things that um, you know other companies didn't really copy. Uh, at least not in this way. You know, there were some later instruments, um, and some of the Hofners had um, onboard effects, and um, some of the later things like the uh, Electra MPC series had kind of standardized this type of thing with plug-in cartridges that all use the same pins and they had integrated circuits as well as the Kent effector guitars that came later. They utilized ICs to do a lot of this, but Vox just didn't have those available. You know, they were designing these in like late 66. And, um, you know, if you're used to seeing an effect or a tube amp of that time, when you open it up, um, you know, you're going to look at like a flat circuit board, two dimensional plane. You grab your schematic. Everything is kind of spread out from one component to the next across the board. And it's really easy to follow along with a schematic and, and troubleshoot, you know, and they just didn't do that. Um, so what they did, since they didn't have ICs to compress that type of a circuit, they essentially folded it in on itself three dimensionally uh, using two sheets of single-sided printed circuit board and then ping-ponging components from one end of the board to the other board and oftentimes bending axial components into radial shapes 
or vice versa. Typically all your transistor leads will be on one um, plane since the leads weren't long enough to really stretch that way. But you're going to find a lot of weirdness in these modules themselves. But just think about the fact that they're, they're three-dimensional um, compressions of the actual circuit. And I think that's where a lot of people run into trouble. Um, you have to constantly go back and forth from one side to the other. There's a few other things that are really quirky about these. Like for instance, um, you know, the modules, um, you have to think three dimensionally, but then of course, to further confuse you, Vox ran all of your elements of the circuit that connected to say power or controls or slide switches out the bottom of the module. And then they would plug and solder them into a motherboard and then route those two pins with wires that connected to your battery leads, uh, slide switches, control potentiometers, whatever. And um, they're just a product of that time. And they kind of did what they had to do to make these things happen. And they couldn't always do things that made sense, I guess. Like your distortion unit um, doesn't have its fuzz cap in the module because, you know, electrodes were bigger. They just couldn't fit it. So there's four different motherboards, but they're all going to have your distortion cap um, on the board. It's right here. And your uh, main power supply filter capacitor is also mounted on the motherboard. Um, you know, they just couldn't fit them. Like this is a 100 microfarad, 12 uh, volt Ducati cap. And, you know, that's uh, what a cap looked like of that value in 66. Here's a modern like 2014 produced 1000 microfarad at a higher voltage at 16 volts. 10 times more capacitance, more voltage rating, but it's like physically smaller. And um, if you understand it from that point of view, it all should make sense, especially when you're dealing with a module and realizing you have to go back and forth um, between the two boards to trace everything out and troubleshoot. When you're servicing the um, onboard effects or troubleshooting them, there's some things you can do to um, just make everything go a lot smoother and make it less of a headache. Um, one simple thing is just get them up off of the bench in a secure way. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, like I don't have a particular jig for, for working on these because each model has a different body and um, sometimes I need to move them around. So I just wrap some two by fours and soft towels like this just so I can get at the front in the, uh, the various slide switches and controls and then simultaneously get at the back where the effects modules are and test for continuity and so forth. So you definitely want to get them off the bench. So once you do that, you know, they all have a back pad, obviously. Most of them are round, some are trapezoidal, like on the Phantom Deltas. Um, so get that off of there. And then one caveat is that even though every guitar or bass is going to have this exact same round effects cover plate, um, the invaders actually have a hole because of where they mounted your e-tuner on an invader was kind of convenient. So you could actually just access it um, through this hole without removing the whole cover plate to adjust the pitch. Uh, most of them, the only thing you can do is remove the top screw and um, replace the battery. But on the invader, you can actually adjust your e-tuner. On any other model, you got to get rid of that too to do anything back here. Okay, so there's some tools as well that are really gonna make this whole thing go a lot easier. And often I find I don't even have to pull any of the modules out of the guitar to find the problem if I just have a audio probe. And again, it doesn't have to be fancy or expensive. This is uh, just some stuff I got at Radio Shack. It's a mono amp you know, with a mono lead, a chopstick with a nail and a capacitor and a ground. And you're gonna hook the ground to any ground point in the circuit. And then you can actually test each point and even get in between the modules and the motherboard to test and see if you're getting signal through. You know, multimeter for continuity and all that's great. Two, obviously a soldering iron, but I gotta tell you like, if you can just make one of these up, um, I think it's about $20 worth of parts from Radio Shack it's really, really gonna make things easier and um, be less invasive. Having to pull things out to test is not something you wanna do on these. Um, mainly because 
the signal wire is so thin and these weren't designed to really come back apart that easily. Um, you know, they're, they're going to go together easy if you ever have to rebuild a module and um, you know, that's pretty straightforward, but pulling them back apart, especially with delicate um, parts like tropical fish capacitors are notoriously brittle. Um, you just don't want to have to mess with the um, boards themselves too much. And you got to be really careful. Um, RG Keen's got some great tips on servicing these over at his Geofex site as well. Um, but anyway, once it's off the bench, remove whether it's the pick guard or the chrome plate that holds your controls and slide switches. Go ahead and remove all those screws, but retain some of the screws in a screwdriver. Because as you move this thing back and forth to get it either side, you don't ever want to pull on that hairline thin wire that some of the um, controls have going to them. Because it just doesn't take a lot of strain and you can create more problems than the ones that you're in there trying to fix. Um, another thing, if you do have to pull a module out of the guitar and replace parts or work on it, you want to have a breadboard um, handy so you can actually then plug the module into the breadboard and then test it um, outside of the guitar because you don't want to find out like oh now I've got it all back together and something's still not right I gotta take it all back apart these just don't really stand up to a lot of um, you know uh, back and forth um, coming apart and putting them back together if you um, do run into a situation um, like this guy did servicing his own guitar where the board had cracked while he was trying to pull apart his wah module um, so he just sent me the whole thing to see if I could um, you know get everything working again you know don't don't freak out if um, this is the state that that you found it in and you think it's beyond repair because I actually have a Vox box and I've got just everything you can think of. Uh, let's see, all the motherboards here for, you know, ultrasonics, everything. I mean, I've got, <clears throat> excuse me, modules pre-built and tested. So if you just want to keep it going again and you found that, you know, a uh, trace has come off of the board and whatnot and you don't want to Mickey Mouse things back together, you can just... Um, Go ahead and shoot me an email and you know we'll sort it out i have all the vintage period correct uh components as well in terms of the caps and resistors and transistors but anyway uh one more thing real quick you're going to want to have on hand is just an led and you'll see that later it's going to really come in handy testing the repeater so if you're going to service them um, this is a good way to start things off once you've got it opened up, um, most of these you're going to see some form of what you see here. Um, most of them that have more than two effects, three effects, are going to have a motherboard that's secured by a couple screws. So you're going to go on ahead to get full access of all the modules, remove those, and um, get the motherboard loose so you can get to um, both sides. And then just a quick um, visual idea of what everything is. A lot of people at first glance see an inductor here on your uh, E-tuner or G-tuner. And the guitars, they maybe they think it's a wah because of the inductor, but um, you actually do have a wah inductor down here, but you can't really see it um, until you get this module out of the guitar. One caveat as well is that some of these have the wah as a satellite unit. Okay, and some of them have them mounted on a motherboard, like in the ultrasonics. And uh, the early ones had this as a satellite epoxied in, and then later they um, simply brazed a brass bracket and then held them in with two screws. So it's pretty much the same exact circuit traces and circuit boards and parts, but instead of having it as a satellite with the signals coming out here, some models like the ultrasonic will have this flipped on the board and there'll be pins that plug in like the other modules. But anyway, each module will have an identifying number etched into the board, except for the E-tuner. Your wah is 1361 and your repeater is 1353. 
and the distortion is 1348 and treble bass booster is 1351 and they're all also going to have a sandwich construction except for the e-tuner um, the e-tuner is a single plane circuit board with everything exposed and open but that's what everything looks like your wah-paw is is here <clears throat> it's pretty self-explanatory as you um, move the palm wah that's your your slide pot um, and those will go so We'll show you some tricks on how to service those as well.